In this video, we're going to be talking about Unit 2, Part 1, Lesson 2 of our Calculus class. And we'll be covering graphs of derivatives and talk about some rules or shortcuts of derivatives in this lesson. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is to graph the following function and sketch its derivative. Now remember, with a piecewise function, uh, we've got components of a graph that we'll, gra uh, that we'll sketch or that we'll draw in different portions of the domain. And I think there was a typo when I copied this into my note for, uh, uh, format here. Let's go ahead and put an equal sign here and here. So for any x value that's less than or equal to negative 2, we're going to use this function, negative x. For any x value that's greater than or equal to 0, we'll use this function. And then for the x values in between, we're going to use this function to sketch its graph. So um, let's just put some marks here, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and 1, 2, 3 as well. And on the y-axis, we'll make some marks here. And we're just sketching, so this isn't super critical. But as long as we get the appropriate characteristics, then I'd be happy. So if we were going to draw the function um, negative x without any domain restrictions, it would look something like this. It's a slope of, it's a linear equation, a slope of negative 1, and uh, it extends through the origin because it has no y-intercept. But we're only using this function for x values that are less than or equal to negative 2. So essentially from this point to the left. So what I'm going to have to do is erase um, a significant portion of this function. And it stops right about here. And then this chunk is going to have to go away. And since we've got an equal to sign, we are going to put a bit of a closed dot right there. For the next equation, we've got uh, x plus 4, so we need a y-intercept of 4 up here, and again a slope of positive 1. I want to make sure that I get this right, and I'm looking at my prior graph. My scaling was drawn by hand, so it's off a little bit. I'm going to shift this down some, and hopefully you caught this mistake when you were drawing yours. Remember, this um, y-coordinate should be on the same level as 2. The x-coordinate should be in line with 2, negative 2 here as well. So I think that's a little bit better. I think that position's pretty good. So now as I graph um, this middle equation for the x-values between negative 2 and 0, then we have a slope of positive 1, y-intercept of 4. Um, that graph is going to look something like this. And I'm not going to let it extend too far to the left because I know it only picks up right about here. But once again, I don't want it to continue too far to the right. We don't need this component here at all. It actually stops. And there would be an open circle here, but as you may have noticed, these components are actually going to connect with one another, and the next line is no different. Uh, we again have a y-intercept of 4. This time we have a slope of negative 1 half, and so uh, we're going to continue this uh, piecewise function with a slope of negative 1 over 2, down 1 over 2, and it kind of looks like, let's see if I can get this scale close, down 1 over 2, down 2, and over 4, oh, right about here I think would be okay. Again, this isn't a perfectly drawn sketch, but it is indicative of the behavior on each of these intervals. So there's the graph of the function. This is the function f of x, the original graph. Uh, the next thing we need to do is sketch its derivative. Now remember the derivative function is the slope function. So the slope of each of these lines should be considered when drawing the graph of this next function. Um, so let's just start picking some points. Let's, let's pick some x values that are less than negative 2. If I'm sitting over here in this um, yellow domain and I start picking points along this graph, since this is a linear function, the slopes don't change. And for each of these red points, the slope is negative 1. And I know that because of the equation, this mx plus b linear equation notation uh, tells me that the slope was negative 1. 
So uh, for x values that are less than or equal to 2, I am going to draw the line negative 1 or y equals negative 1 because that's our slope in this particular region. Now if we look right at this point of transition, what's the slope there? Well, from the left, on the left side, we have a slope of negative 1, and on the right side, we've got a slope of positive 1. But what about that point right at transition? Well, as you may have guessed, it's impossible to tell what the slope is at that particular point. There's a corner in the graph. So I'm going to put an open circle at the end of this transition, and I'm going to put an open circle at the start of this one, because all of these points have a slope of positive 1, so the slope equation or the derivative equation here is going to be y equals 1. For the rest of the f of x um, equation the slope is negative 1 half so we'll go ahead and start this section of the graph at y equals negative 1 half and we will continue out to the right indefinitely. So as it turns out, the derivative of this particular function is another piecewise function itself, but the combination of all of these components is what we would call the uh, derivative of the original function. So I'm going to use the derivative notation, and the position on the derivative function gives us the slope of the original function. If we had this graph that extended all the way out to here, and let's say we picked an x value of something like 10, well, the derivative function appears to be sitting right here at negative one-half, and that would indicate that the slope of this function as it continues down here is still also equal to negative one-half. Picking any point in between zero and negative two, looking at the derivative function, tells us that the slope here is one-half, and so on. So the results of the derivative function tell us how steep the original function is. Let's see if we can do the same thing for g of x. Now this g of x function um, appears to be a downward facing, almost a, a downward w or an m shape. This is likely a, a quartic graph, a fourth degree polynomial. I'll go ahead and put these tails on here just uh, because it's likely that they exist. And if we're being asked to sketch what the derivative of this particular function would look like, I think it would be helpful to find a couple key points of focus. And those key points of focus are going to be at the extreme values, the maximum and the minimum points. Why I find those particularly useful is because we should have an idea of what the slope is at these positions. Think about it. As this curve flattens out, and we know that the derivative function measures the steepness of a curve, we can kind of answer this question. How steep is the curve at this point? How steep is the curve at that point? And how steep is the curve at this point? Well, in all three of these cases, the slope is equal to zero because the curve essentially flattens out. It's not like what we had up here where there was a sharp corner in the graph. That's something different. It's not like we had a sharp corner here, but it was a smooth bend that flattened out and the graph leveled off and had a slope of zero. Well, if the slope was zero, then we're going to say that the derivative is also equal to zero at that point. And if we're trying to graph this, when is the derivative equal to zero? Well, I'm just gonna put a dot on the x-axis at each of those correlating positions. When x was negative three, we have a slope of zero. When x was negative 1, we have a slope of 0. When x is positive 1, we have a slope of 0. And I know that it's 0 visually because the y value, the y component of each of these coordinates, is 0 itself. So I'm going to erase these marks for just a second. I'll leave the dotted lines in place. But let's start working from left to right now, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the rest of this derivative function. Um, if we look at this particular section of the graph, I think we could all agree that this section of the graph is increasing. And if the section of the graph is increasing, then therefore it has a positive derivative or positive slope. And if I'm trying to show positive numbers, 
in a function, then I need to show numbers that are above the x-axis. I think also we can make the argument that the graph is more steep here or more positive on the far left-hand side, and it becomes less and less positive as we approach that point of flattening off. So if I'm going to sketch the derivative from here, I might say, well, at negative 3, it was just barely positive. But as we move further and further left, the graph became more and more positive and more and more positive and more and more positive the further left we went, assuming that this graph continues in this direction here. So as I'm sketching this derivative, I might say, well, this is the shape of the derivative on the left side. Again, this red graph indicates the steepness of the black graph. It's really positively steep at this point. Still steep, positive slope, but not nearly as much down here because it's pretty close to the x-axis. The graph of the derivative is now close to the x-axis. In this middle section, we transitioned into a decreasing graph. And when we have a decreasing slope, or I'm sorry, a decreasing function, a decreasing function implies a negative slope. So positive slopes, positive functions were above the x-axis. Negative slopes are below the x-axis. And so here again, we're kind of negative, kind of negative, kind of negative. Our steepness is increasing downward, but then we level off again and are just slightly negative and almost zero as we reach the end of this section. And so that portion of the graph might end up looking something like this as we read from left to right. Here, we're below the x-axis, so we are all negative. All of these are negative and imply a downward-facing slope of our original graph. The further we drop means the more steep the graph is in a negative direction. And that kind of is what we saw right here. This section of the graph is the steepest that it gets in that section, and it correlates to the lowest point on that derivative function. We see a similar behavior in the next section, where this time we um, encounter a positive slope again. We're increasing upwards. We find the steepest portion of that positive slope in this region right here. And we're just slightly positive on the right of this point, slightly positive on the left. But all along, we are positive the whole way. So our uh, graphed points here should all be above the x-axis, with the highest point right here in the middle. And then we're curving downward. And again, this section is showing all positive y values on the derivative. And positive y values of the derivative indicate increasing function of the, or increasing uh, movement on the original function. And at the very end here, we've got negative derivatives that are uh, only slightly negative at the beginning. They're only downward sloping for a little bit, and, uh, or barely downward sloping at the beginning, I should say and they become increasingly downward sloping as we move. And so if I were to continue this sketch, I might show something like this, where the function is negative the entire time, the derivative function is negative the entire time, and it's increasing, in a sense, away from the x-axis, and we're going down further and further, so the steepness of this graph must be increasing towards the negative direction. And I want to point out something here. At the start, I said that this g of x function almost looks like it was some sort of quartic graph, right? And if this was a quartic graph to begin with, a fourth degree polynomial, then maybe you might notice what's happening here on our derivative function. Well, this kind of looks like a cubic graph, doesn't it? And if we had started with a quartic, and ended with a cubic, does that support some of the patterns that you saw during the last video's discussion? Hopefully it does. Before we get into some rules, I do want to talk about two theorems. I'm going to ask you to complete one sketch on your own, and then we'll get into the rules for uh, finding derivatives. Number one, uh, this word differentiable is our way of saying that we can find a derivative. Differentiable means to find, or uh, able to find a derivative. 
So we're saying that a particular function is differentiable. We can find the derivative of f at a point a. If that can be done, then the function must be continuous at that point and actually passes the continuity checklist. So that's an important theorem. If a function is differentiable, if it has a derivative, then we know that the function is continuous. Now, we can't just switch those two phrases around. I can't say that if a function is continuous, then therefore it's differentiable. That would be inappropriate logic. But an alternate version of the original theorem that is acceptable is as follows. If a function is not continuous at a point, then it is not differentiable at that point. So if the graph is not continuous, if continuity fails at a particular point, then we cannot find its derivative at that point. And that plays into what we see here. From last unit, we would immediately notice that x equals negative 2 is a um, point of where the function breaks continuity. Therefore, we do not have a derivative that can be found at an x value of negative 2. At positive 2, we see the same thing. This is a point of discontinuity because the function is not defined here. Therefore, we cannot find the derivative or the steepness of the graph at that point. Now, those two are good, um, I would say, obvious points where the derivative can't be found. But one that's a little bit less obvious is this point right here, and it actually plays into our very first example that we saw today. This location is not differentiable either, but the function is continuous. And so just as theorem 3.1 stated that um, if a function is differentiable, therefore it's continuous, the alternate form, which is going to help us out here, or perhaps emphasize the point that I'm trying to make here. If it's not continuous, then it's not differentiable. Here we have a continuous graph. I can draw this section of the graph without picking up my pen or pencil. But just because it's continuous does not mean that it's differentiable. This cusp, we call this a curved corner a cusp. This cusp prevents us from being able to find how steep the graph is at that spot. Think of it. Uh, the derivative is negative, negative, negative all the way down here because the steepness, the slope, is downward facing as we move from left to right. And then we hit the bottom of this cusp, and then all of a sudden the derivative switches to positive. It's increasing, or it's a positive slope as we move from left to right. And that point of transition is neither positive nor negative. It can't be super downward facing with a negative slope and then super positive facing with a positive slope uh, at the same time. And so that cusp or corners as we saw at the beginning of this video imply that we cannot find the derivative. So what I'd like for you to do is pause the video and try sketching the derivative much like we did in the last example by imagining particular points along the way and indicating how steep the slope is from left to right. Resume playback in a moment to check your work. So this is what I came up with. And your graph could be correct, even if it doesn't match mine precisely. But let me explain what's happening here and see if I can um, at least convince you as to why I think this would be a good description of the derivative. Let's start with this portion of the original function. On this portion of the, ori portion of the original function, the graph was sloped upwards at every spot. So if I started considering each of these positions, I would recognize that the slope of the tangent line at each of those positions is positive, and it's increasing just a little bit. Right? Each one is getting just slightly steeper. So because of that, I started plotting a positive series of points, and those positive points were increasing or moving up the y-axis just a little bit because the steepness was increasing. Then at x equals negative 2, I broke the graph because I know I can't find a derivative here because the function is not continuous. But as I turned my attention to this leg of the graph, this section of the graph here, I noticed that every one of the points on this section is sloping downward. All of these tangent lines have a negative slope. So what that tells me is that the y values of the derivative must be below the x-axis, and we're 
um, we're indicating that here. I made an estimate that right at this point of transition the graph is virtually flat and if it's almost flat then its derivative is very close to zero uh, but then immediately it's downward facing so I started dropping below the x-axis. Down here the graph is almost perfectly vertical which means it has an infinite slope which we really can't represent with a drawing so I'm showing perhaps an asymptote here. If I had a dotted line to represent an asymptote on the uh, function, I think that would be appropriate because this section of the graph is getting increasingly negatively steep, if that's such a word, and the y values are increasingly moving farther away from x, or they're decreasing in value down the y-axis. Similarly, on the right side, as soon as we made the transition to this section here, we became significantly steep, almost, uh, almost perfectly vertical on the right-hand side, and if we're almost perfectly vertical here, and then we start leveling off just a little bit as we move to the right, these become closer and closer to zero. Those slopes become closer and closer to zero, and so I would argue that the graph this time is decreasing towards zero. We said again that this hole in the graph creates a, um, a point of discontinuity. So we can't find the derivative there. I'll leave a hole in the graph, but it does kind of look like the graph is leveling off. So uh, we would be approaching a y value of zero at that point. And the graph is leveling off, but then as we move further to the right, it becomes downward facing again and more steep one more time. And it's decreasing in steepness. So the y values are decreasing as well. So that's my argument for why I feel that this is the shape of your graph, or the shape of the derivative graph. If you're pretty confident in your work, but it doesn't look like mine, uh, bring it to me in class and we can chat about it to see if what you've done is indeed correct, or if, uh, if you may have been off base just a little bit with your sketch. And so to finish this video, I'd like to give you some shortcuts, and then we can explain them in further detail in another video. The first shortcut, is called the constant rule. And if the function f of x is equal to some number c, an equation might look something like this, f of x equals 5. Well, think of the line that's created when, when f of x equals 5. Well, that's a perfectly flat horizontal line. Here's f of x equals 5. Well, what's the steepness of a horizontal line? That's always 0. So our derivative rule would be f prime of x is equal to 0. If f of x equals some number, c, then f prime of x is equal to 0. Using all, our alternative notation, we would say something like this, dy dx is equal to 0. For our second example, we'll call this the constant multiple rule. This time we have a constant, some number c, that multiplies by some other function. An example might look something like this. f of x might be defined as 3 times, oh, I don't know, x squared, and g of x happens to be x squared. Well, this rule states that the derivative of f is equal to the constant, whatever the constant value is, times the derivative of the inner function. Or in other words, we could essentially ignore this constant, find the derivative of the inner function, and once we find the derivative of that inner function, we simply multiply it by the constant again, and we would have the overall derivative for that particular example. And in alternative notation, this is going to be a bit confusing until we have a chance to talk about it in class, but it would be something like this. The derivative of y with respect to x is equal to the constant times the derivative with respect to x of the function g. And I feel clarification on this notation will be an important topic to discuss. If you um, do your own research on your side, on a side, that's uh, perfectly fine. If you would like to uh, include this in our discussion for next week, that would be just fine too. Uh, let me know if you think that would be important. Um, otherwise, I'll just continue to use the um, 
the notation in our videos moving forward, and hopefully that would be sufficient for you to catch up. For our next rule, the sum and differences rule, it says something like this. If a function is comprised of the sum or difference of two other functions, say we have an equation that looks like this, one function plus or minus another function, uh, finding the derivative of that original function is actually pretty easy to do. We would simply find the derivative of the first function, we would find the derivative of the second function, and we would either add or subtract as specified in the original function. And in using our alternate notation, we would say the derivative of y with respect to x is simply equal to the derivative with respect to x of the function g plus or minus the derivative with respect to x of the function h. And now for our power rule, and this is really good for polynomials that we've seen in the last couple days. Hopefully you've been able to come up with your rules. Here we go. Uh, let's say we've got an example, f of x equals x to the tenth power. The power rule said that, or says that, the derivative of this function, if there is a base of x with an exponent, uh, say n, uh, would be equal to n times x to the n minus 1 power. And essentially what happens is the exponent from here drops to the front, and then we have to reduce that exponent by 1. And I think that might have been the power that, or the, the pattern that many of you were seeing before. The exponent drops down to the front, and the old exponent gets reduced by 1. And this rule happens to be the derivative for this particular function at the beginning. In alternate notation, it may look something like this. The derivative of y with respect to x is equal to n times x to the n minus 1 power as well. Not a whole lot of difference between those two. To finish out the video, I've got six examples here I'd like for you to try on your own using those rules that we just established. See if you can figure out what the derivative would be, and we'll use standard or the original notation for each of these. If you would, pause the video now and resume playback in a moment to check your work. And here are the solutions to those six problems. I would encourage you to look at these solutions and if your answers were different than mine, try to figure out how I got to each of my solutions. If you have further questions on how they were established, then by all means reach out to me and we'll talk about them next time we meet. But before I close out the video, I do want to point out this very last example here. It's often going to be helpful for us to think of radicals as um, powers or rational exponents. So let's keep in mind that the square root of a number is the same as that number raised to the one half power. And so if we have this base raised to the one-half power, we can now utilize the power rule in which we multiply. We bring down the exponent of one-half times six turned into a three, and then subtract this power by one, which turned into a negative one-half. In a sense, this would have been okay as a, as a derivative rule. However, um, what I would like to point out here is that our original function started with a radical. So I would prefer that our final answer contains radicals as well. So the final answer here that I would prefer to see is 3 over square root of t. We know that the 1 half power creates the radical square root, and the fact that it's negative pushed it to the denominator of a fraction. So I recognize that was a lot to cover in this video. I uh, hope you were able to follow along with that, even if you broke it up into several sittings. If you have any further questions on this, please reach out to me, and we'll either set up a time to meet virtually or in person. Thanks for watching.